to play. Welcome. Welcome to Up Close, Meet the Poet Behind the Verse. I am your host, River Maria Erke, and here to help me pull this off is a mutual poet, Julie Martin. Hi. Um, we showcase one poet a month with an interview, poetry reading, and giveaway. It is our goal to introduce the person behind the poems. But today we have a little, a little special. Today we have a special couple show, and we'll get, I'll get to that first. First, um, to remind our, our Zoom audience to remain muted during the duration of the show. And, um, and we'll be having a giveaway today. And give a shout out to our sponsor, Minnesota Poets. And remind us all that we're live on Facebook. So with that, I'd like to introduce our February 2022 Up Close Poets, Hardy and Petey. They met in 2016. Hardy was driving cab and Petey, his passenger. The perfect start to a romantic story, which it is, but the so we'll wait, it's best to hear it from them. But currently they reside in Minneapolis in the heart of the third precinct. A little background on each. Hardy Coleman grew up a country boy surrounded by horses in Texas until he moved to Minnesota in 1973. He had been, he has been a city boy for the last 40 years, working in an array of jobs while raising three children. Hardy is a poet, a playwright, a producer, a woodworker, and a gardener waiting for his first book to finish publishing. On to Petey, AKA Patricia Enger, uh, is a model, an actor, a producer, a singer, and a storyteller waiting for the pandemic to end for work to begin again. She grew up in Jackson, Minnesota and graduated with a double majors in fine arts, painting and theater from the Southwest Minnesota State University in Marshall, Minnesota. Over the next 40 years, she lived her marvelous life acting and in plays and films. Oops. Working with clothes and art and tried her luck with men and four marriages and a farmer, a rancher, a painter and a gallery director till she met Hardy. In 2019, <laughs> Hardy and Petey produced together Good Friday, Round One by Fat Chance Productions, a play written by Hardy and directed by Petey. Now let us welcome Petey and Hardy. Hello. Hello. We are the Siamese poets. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, you two. Um, to begin, I know I'm not alone in asking. Can you share your stories with us and how you came together? Start. Well, I was driving cab and uh, got a call to pick up and she got in and I kept eyeballing her in the rear view mirror and we were talking. She was going to a friend's show and she said she was in a friend's show and she told me which one. I said, that's my friend Carl's show. So oh, Carl friends. And so, yeah, I'll be there, you know. Um, forgive me, Carl, but it wasn't really for you. Um, so I went, <laughs> <laughs> and not only was Carl and Vicky and and Jim Smith were also in friends of mine. So after the show, I was standing there talking to them, and she was standing off in the distance, and I just kept thinking, "Hey, come on, come on, come on!" But she didn't. She's being too polite. So I, uh, my daughter, had put me on Facebook about five years before, and I probably said two things in the five years like hi or happy birthday or something, you know. Uh, never liked anything or anyone. Still don't like anyone. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, she was on Facebook, so I started stalking her on Facebook for about a year. And then she had a storytelling thing where I showed up and asked her at the end of it, uh, can I give you a ride home? And I pretended to get lost. Your turn. I, I, I've ridden taxis since I moved up to Minneapolis and so I kind of knew the way home from certain places and it's like 
wow, this is a long way home. And <laughs> on the way home, he, he said he had gotten into the fringe for the next year and um, he had a play and would I consider being one of his actors? And I said, sure. He said, well, I'll send you the play. Well, he sent me seven plays. Sure. <laughs> they're short plays and they're all about Jesus. And <laughs> the one with Mary, he wanted me to be Mary Magdalene. And so I get this, the, the one, play that he wanted to do for sure but there was time that he could fit in one of these other little uh, other smaller ones and I'm reading this poem this play of his and I'm going my god this is incredible and I fell in love with all of the characters and I'm going this is I could not learn my lines because as soon as I get cast in something I start on my lines I couldn't do it and I'm not a pushy person but I got to get, and I said you know I, I can't, I can't do this. I, I can't keep my mind off the other characters. Would you mind if I directed this? Well, as it happened, he didn't have a director, so he let me direct it. I hadn't directed anything since American Buffalo. And it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful as an artist, but more wonderful, I, I got to know Hardy in the process. Yeah, she took me to dinner and at, at, at Hell's Kitchen. And uh, I just remember we talked till they closed and they had to run us out. And uh, we were in the parking lot and I said, you really been married four times? She said, yeah. That's when I said, well, I want to be number five. <laughs> and of course I thought he was joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here we are. <laughs> uh, so that's basically how we met. Yeah. yeah. Uh. So let's learn a little bit about each of you. We'll begin with Hardy. So I hear you have a green thumb. Gardening is your forte. Well, what do you like to grow? And what do you, do you is, what is your favorite food to make from your harvest? Boy, uh, salsas, chutneys, pickles. And then there's a the short term things, you know, like uh, greens. And what else? Do we, what do we eat all the time? Your pesto is oh, incredible. Oh yeah, the pesto. Yeah, the pesto. Garlic scape pesto. Yeah, is incredible. Is this so sort of the kind of garlic that you use? You said was like really long. It's called hard neck, and it, it shoots a, a. It looks like a long neck of a dragon. It just shoots up out of the wow. ground. And it has a real curly like this. And then it gets a. At the end, it has a bud on the end, and that would be seeds, but. It, it kind of wrecks the garlic out in the ground if you let it go to seed. So you cut it off before that and make pesto out of it. It's, uh, it's um, pretty good. Yeah. We'll have to have a pesto contest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I mean, we had tons of tomatoes this year and almost no cucumbers. Last year, we had lots of cucumbers, but not that many tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Not a green I think my cousin who has a huge garden didn't have yeah. any tomatoes either. Uh, it must have been a bad year. Well, no, we had tomatoes this year. This this year was, was last year. She didn't have them. Yeah, oh, just yeah. five five different kinds he had, and he he knows I love raspberries, so he planted raspberry <laughs> bushes. And they're huge. We got three raspberries last year. I mean, individual three individual raspberries off this huge huge <laughs> bush. <laughs> I think it takes a couple of years for raspberries to kind of. It's just like it. four now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that is, yeah. So maybe a little bit. Um, you also dabble in woodworking. Yeah, a bit. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll go get it. Yeah, go get Can it. You talk about it. it. Yeah, yeah. I do. I've been learning. You know, I've done a lot of carpentry. You know, as kind of as a living, and just because where I live, I'd like to build stuff and. Uh, but woodworking is a little new, so I'm getting better learning a bit. And I'm for either your, was this it your is birthday for, or it was for Christmas. Yeah. And he made this for me, and it's a caterpillar on this side. Yeah. And then you turn it and it's a butterfly. So I depending on how I feel the day, I will either be the caterpillar or the butterfly. Yeah. And that's a monarch. They come to our, we have a lot of milkweed when they come around. Yeah. And I, 
I love it. It's it's like folk art, and it, that's my favorite kind of art. And also, I made this for. Oh, that's nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a stitched up art, which is kind of like us. And then I got oh. another thing. This is not exactly woodworking, but it looks like a box of candies. Mm -hmm. And if I can get it open, hold it. <laughs> it's really hard to open. It's supposed to just pop right open. It doesn't. Can you have 10? Oh, fun. It's got, is there a face on that? No, no. yeah, it's a little pair of lips smiling. There. Oh, fun. Oh, there's it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. So it seems there are a lot of poets that get serious about poetry. Well, I, I guess that is they start writing more about more when something life changing happens to them. In some ways, it's our therapy. What was the big life change that happened to you? Well, a couple. One, I mean, we're going to talk about this later. I was. I was raped by a bigger, older kid when I was 13, lived down the block. And it was blocked from my memory for, God, 25 years or so. And waking up to that was kind of a beginning. Um, but I think the biggest change of what got me to write was going to prison. And I started the day I got in and, you know, pretty steadily ever since. Uh, for a while. I go through dry spells. I just came out of a couple of year dry spell here or even longer, but uh, where I wrote very, very little, but I'll be gone again, which feels good. Uh, but yeah, going to prison was the big, the big. How big, long were you there? I was only there 16 months. I was in Duluth. It was federal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we mentioned before that you have, you're waiting for a book to get published yeah. and the pandemic is kind of making it pokey yeah uh, it's it's not your it's not a poetry book though it's it's oh, actually yeah. a children's book can you tell us a little bit about it that's just titled game day and it's being published by uh moonfire publishing right yeah yeah moonfire publishing they're local they did lauren's book uh and it's coming out soon i don't know it was supposed to come out in december but things getting pushed back um it's illustrated beautifully illustrated by a friend of Petey's. and uh oh i don't know it's just it was based on uh hearing once i'll grant you somebody said i'll grant you one wish just one and the story came out of that kid oh. it, Climb down into a magic sewer with all sorts of monsters who want to eat him and stuff. But he's trying to get a base, find a baseball that went down there because he tripped when he's trying to field it and went down the sewer. Mm -hmm. And and the, the somebody illustrated it. Yeah, yeah, guy named uh, Curtis Sloop. And, uh, it's a, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. You know. Cool. Yeah. Another book that you were in. Actually, in 2018, you were part of an anthology, The Road by Heart, Homes of Fatherhood with Mike Finley, Robert Bly, Richard Broderick, and many more. All men, all fathers. What did it mean to you to be part of this project? It was, it was, I guess, kind of cathartic to want to go through. I hadn't realized I wrote so many poems for my kids. And to go through, you know, and, and say, oh, yeah. And then just the feeling of camaraderie with, with this, these other guys, you know, a lot, most of whom I had, had never met, met Mike Finley through that, you know, and, and Greg Watson, one of the editors, we've gotten to be good friends and Michael Clever Diggs and just a bunch, a lot of the guys in there. And it, it's, and we did readings and they were always really sweet to, to, you know, be together and, you know, you like a bunch of guys and you know cut up a little bit um you know i think of it as is it's like a it's like a boys it's like a boys club yeah, yeah I, I do i is. Even some of the ladies talk about that um yeah. inside there uh, well can you hear a poem from there one of your poems yeah you got a you got one in mind or 
Um, uh, I'll read this and wrote it for my eldest, Marga. It's just titled, I'm on my glasses. It's titled Freight. By the time this rumination is delivered down the tracks, it will be gone, just like a child. By the years in which she grows into another name, the toys that we play with are discarded, the commerce of our days. We'll have shipped the weight of innocence and debt to our cities back home and left the tariff hanging on an empty car full of dreamers, past due bills, and starlight for direction. Locomotives whistle. We cannot help but dance. Aww. Well, you and PD are actually going to be gifting two of these books away today. Uh, they, um, they it's Thing. Me one too, so I, I, I got a copy. <laughs> um, so for our Zoom audience, we are playing the number game. It's each person gets to pick a number between one and 50. You get one guess and you can put it in the chat. Whoever comes closest to the number without going over will be the winner. And we will have two of those and we'll announce it at the end. So... Um, well, Hardy, me and you actually met in what we decided, came up with 2012, 2013, somewhere. Something like that, yeah. Somewhere around there, at Actually, the artist quarter. Yeah. 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 Open mic. That was yeah. a cool place. Yeah. Um, I'm Must curious how long... Yeah. Writing down those numbers, or have you got them? I hope. Oh, I got them. I, I know the numbers. Okay. I got to still pass them off to poor Julie, who's probably like, "Wherever you never gave me the numbers. Well, and I, I'm recording the guesses, so I've got that part covered. Okay. I'll, I'll get the numbers to you. They're in my head. Um, no. But so how long have you been going to open mics and, and reading poetry? Oh, much since I got out of prison in 94, maybe a little, oh, wow. little, little later than that. But I mean, there were several around town, you know, I would go. Um, started with the, the Irish Well in St. Paul, where, where Menards is now. Uh, okay. And then the, the owner, as they say, drank, it, drank the profits. So that club, but we moved around and then Came upon the artist quarter quite a few years, you know, later. And when it started, it was just Paula Suzuki was, you know, tending bar, waiting tables there. And it was her, Jim Smith, and me. And we just sat around a table and read stuff to each other. And it grew from there. So. It was pretty big when I was there. Yeah, it, it got very big, you know. There was a lot of musicians. Yeah, a lot of music. And then comics just came flooding in after a while. Um, some of them were even, even funny on occasion. Uh, oh, um, yeah, that was cool. I, I really liked that place. And they had that, that jazz, a jazz band that always started off. Yeah, yeah. Played before. Well, I know you kind of giggled when I asked you this or before I told you I was going to ask you. But uh, how would you describe your voice in poetry? Well, when you asked me the other day, I just said, read this stuff, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I guess the only thing that I can think of is when I write, and whether it's poetry, fiction, or, or a play, I guess I try to write the way that people talk. That's, that's interesting. One of the things I wrote down was you tell it as it is. Oh, well, as it is or isn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I also think you have a very masculine a protector that stands yeah. in the back. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I was in 2017, you guys produced a play together. A Good Friday, round one, written by you, Hardy, 
and directed by you too. You spoke on this a little bit earlier. How is it working together? And is there any stories that stand out? His characters were so wonderful. And unfortunately with Fringe, you have X amount of time to get something done. And we had worked together cutting, cutting some speeches. He thought Jesus talked too much. So we cut some of Jesus's lines, but it came down to, there was one character. If we removed one, character our timing would be perfect and it was one of my favorite character he was he was this beautiful beautiful man and it just ripped me up and i'm tearing up talking about to have to cut him but we did it and we went to went to the hard times late at night stayed up just you know slash and burn but we got it cut down i think we well worked very well together for what was a pretty difficult task yeah and yeah so i mean that was important to me fringe fringe was an education um we were in the only venue where you could not leave your props your props <laughs> yeah and we had made a boxing ring out of cement and wood in five gallon buckets. And I didn't want the actors to have to move anything. So I was a gopher. <laughs> the old folks here every night would move those those things. It was well, the actors pitched the in. The actors too. pitched in, they, yes. Yeah. We, they, we yeah. couldn't keep them away from it, but it was like, no. So that, that part was was tough. And we mm -hmm. wanted Jesus hung from the ceiling and they wouldn't. We wouldn't let us do that, so we, <laughs> we, had, we had to find a way to make him... We put him in a boxing ring. Yeah, yeah. so that's why he was in the boxing ring, yeah. because they wouldn't let us hang him. Yeah. But, uh, what was the gist of the play? It was kind of the... It was interesting because Hardy wrote it because of his father. Yeah, yeah. My father, he was, he was Christian. His whole life went to church. He's a believer. But one thing he never liked, never cared for, was the resurrection. He says, well, hell, who wouldn't? You know? Who wouldn't want to come back? I mean, that doesn't take any guts. But what kind of a person kills her? And and the other thing, he didn't have, he didn't, he loved Jesus, but he didn't care for Jesus' as old man. Um, I mean, what kind of father sacrifices his own kid, you know? He just, nah, he didn't want anything to do with that guy. Um, but he, he really loved, he, he, he was impressed that Jesus would get up there and just, you know, die like a normal human being and, you know, cash it in early for us. Resurrection, that was bullshit. But, but dying, mm -hmm. he took that for real. And that's what uh, spurred the play. You know, and I feel much the same way. And Mary Magdalene was, uh, Jesus never was called Jesus, just called boss. And Mary Magdalene was his, was his old lady. Well, which I think probably was. Yeah. <laughs> strike me I down. Always, I, yeah, I'll strike it down. I kind of always thought that too myself. Yeah. It's, um, well, now we're going to move on to Petey. First thing I want to know is, where did you get that name? <laughs> well, I was Patricia. As a little kid, I couldn't say Patricia, so I called myself Peta. And when I got to school, I was, I, I had noticed that there was this big difference between girls and boys as far as what they could do. I always had to wear a dress. I didn't like wearing dresses all the time. And so from high school as Pete, it just evolved into Petey because I wanted to be a boy in the respect that I wanted to do everything. I, and I tried to do a lot of things. I, I drag race cars. One of my girlfriends on here, she, she was a motorhead. <laughs> and and uh, 
that was, I guess that was the beauty of growing up in a small town. You maybe got to do more things like that. Of course, some of the people frowned upon the way I conducted myself in cars, but but that's the way it was. But you, but you won oh, a lot. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you have had a very colorful resume. And I, I, would, I thought a good way to kind of dive into that would be if you could describe your favorite job to us and then describe your, your, your worst job. You, know, you would ask me this question and I honestly, I loved every job. I loved walking beans. I loved working in the, working in the implement. Uh, everything I did, I loved, but there were things about each of them I didn't. I didn't love. In real estate, I hated driving 60 miles a day on a, a road with people. I have road rage really bad. When I first got into real estate, I had to sit on my hand when I drove because mm -hmm. that was how I let people know what I thought of their driving. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the, I, I think the, wor the hardest one for me was I, I worked at a lingerie shop and they sold post-mastectomy products. And I had, I was just new learning how to fit people just with lingerie period. But the post-mastectomy of course was more specialized. And this, this six year old girl came in and to help her face what I, it was, it was really tight. And I can't talk about it now without crying. So oh. that, was, that was the toughest. Oh, that's, yeah. What was your favorite? You mentioned something about getting to set up the paintings. Oh, working for my third husband, who was a professor and a professional artist. I, I prepared his canvases. I'd work for a month and a half on each one before he would paint on it. And then I would title them and I would frame them. And he had exhibits all over the world. And I was the one to put the paintings where they belonged. And except for all of the shows he was in, except for two, where the, the gallery and the museum did it themselves. I loved, I loved hanging paintings. Um, I love art, but I loved working with the students for their, uh, he was the director of the gallery in the, in the university as well. And I, I curated it. I would, uh, the shows would come in, I'd unpack them, I'd, figure out where things went, hung them, and then I would light them. And the student, art students would have a senior exhibit. And that was my favorite. It was generally on a Friday, so things had cooled down in the university. And I'd have the students put their works around where they thought they should be. And if I something wasn't quite working in my head, I, we would talk about it. I'd put it the way that I, it worked better for me. And I'd say, but this is your show. You do it your way. And that's, that's how it worked. And then I would do the lighting, have them look to see if the lights were all right. It, that was, that was a, a wonderful time in that job. And getting to meet all these gallery directors and museum people all over the world was oh. a, a treat, just a treat. Totally. One of your majors in school was art, wasn't it? I used to paint humongous pictures of saints. I would see somebody that I thought looked saintly, and I'd ask them if I could take a picture. And then I would, I would, I, I call it a two-haired brush. I would make these little itty-bitty lines and, uh, yeah, I, I didn't paint for anybody but me. It, uh... mm. Totally. Well, you told me you spent your life making men pay for the trauma you went through as a child in the hands of a bad man. But most of that time, you were not aware that that's what was going on. 
And so you went marriage after marriage fell apart. I believe you have a poem for us that you would share with us. I do. And I, I wrote this poem. It was after my memory, because just like Hardy, we had both suppressed the memories. And his came back when he was with somebody he trusted. Mine came back. I was reading a newspaper and something that had happened to somebody else made it come into my head. And I was with my, with my son. And it, yeah, my, for whatever reason, and somebody said he did it because he didn't want me to dwell on it. My third husband, the painter, said that he, after a while, well, when you, when you have a memory stop like that, then you start thinking about other things that come back that, oh, so that's why this happened. That's why that happened. And I, I would mention those things to my husband. And one day he said to me, you know, I don't think those, I don't think that happened to you. I don't think anything that horrible could have happened and you would have forgotten it. So because he was my teacher, he was my husband, he was 15 years older than me and I, I pretty much put him on a pedestal. I slammed it back in my head. But a part of me came up with this poem out of, out of nowhere and it, it kind of showed where I was going to go the rest of my life. And it's very simple. If God turned his back to me for a day and the rest of the world would look away, oh, the things I would do and the things I would say if God turned his back to me for a day. So I knew, I knew there was a very ugly person living in there. And sadly, until being with Hardy, we met. <laughs> I, uh, the ugly part didn't really have have a chance to come out. It's, yeah, it's, 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 some things are worth fighting for, even with each other. You know, it's, it's the way it you know cooking crumbles or whatever. You know? But I I feel sorry for I feel sorry for anyone I dated. And especially anyone I married, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be a nun, to be perfectly honest with you. And a priest told me, you would set the church back 400 years. Oh, that's a poem right there. Now, <laughs> I would say, I think I maybe would have helped advance it 400 years. <laughs> He's, he's dead and gone, and unfortunately, he was a pedophile priest in our parish. Oh. I found that out years later. Yeah. It happens a lot of them turn that way. Things. Yeah. It's really sad. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Gosh. That's... <clears throat> well, I'm curious, how old were you when you realized that you wanted to act? Because that's one thing you big time you do. You know, my brother and I would had these little weird toys and we we would set up, we had like a soap opera going with these things. And <laughs> my I have I have two heroes in my life. That's my father and my sister Lila. Both dad and Lila were in plays. And I saw you know, photos of when they had been in the plays. Lila was in high school when I, there was quite a bit of age difference between us. And it was like, well, you know, what's that all about? She had puppets and stuff. And I get into school and we, we get the coolest teacher anybody could have. He was like three years older with us. He was one of those people who went through school doing summer school. So he comes to us and I don't think he was 21 years old. And he was, he was un unbelievable. He opened, opened my life for me in that respect. Well, that's, um, well, over all these years, you've been, you've been in many plays and done some movies and stuff. And 
You've been in like Alice one, one, in Wonderland, Masks of Angels, Mousetrap. What's your favorite play that you ever did? Do you have one? I have for different reason. In high school, we did Antigone, Ennui's Antigone. And I was Antigone. And one night, it was unbelievable. The audience... And so this is, this is Jackson, this is a little town, but the audience was so with my friend Patrick who played opposite me with us in a scene. And there's a point he slaps me in the face and there was one audible gasp. And after the play, one of my dearest friends who's petite comes back and she jumped on me and she was bawling. And I knew that was what I wanted to get from people. If I could go through life acting and make, making them feel like that audience did. Totally. Well, that was already in high school. Um, Masks of Angels was an incredible show we put on at the university. Bizarrely, or not so perhaps, uh, that was how I met my third husband. He was teaching one of my friends. I had been in a car accident. I'd gone to Southwest to be, to take art from my third husband, but I'd been in a car accident and I was all smashed up. My wrist was smashed. I, I said, you know, art's out for me. But he came to the play, and a couple of days after, after the play, I had gone down to the painting studio to see one of my friends. And the professor, my eventual husband, came over to me and he said, what you did on stage last night was as good as, if not better, than anything I have seen in New York City. And he turned wow. He turned around and walked away. And his student said, he never compliments anybody. So, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> stuck, that stuck to you. Well, you know, I'm curious. Uh, you have one more poem for us to read, don't you? I do. And uh, this, is, this is moving in with Hardy was pretty... <laughs> I, 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 I lived in a condo, I, I had nice clothes and I, I, I was, I, I kind of had a, an idea of what this part of my life was going to be. So I, I wrote this after I moved in, um, I call it this move. Oh, Hardy, Hardy used to live here with a whole bunch of other people. It was a, it was a punk house. Yeah, they were all in their 20s. Yeah. <laughs> so, from your toxic housemate to a heaving floor, I have endeavored to rise above it all. Moving from a pristine condo in the clouds, ensconced on the city skyline, I now slog through the dirt and dust, a resident of some very mean streets. And the toll on my soul has been noted. But this week, exactly where I had only a short time ago found a used syringe, I found a diamond engagement ring. You told me it was a sign. I know that it was. Internal and external demons can't pull me away from this house or from you. I told you when I met you, I am known for discovering diamonds in the rough. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. you said well, you know, you two live, like I, I think I said right in the beginning, you live in the third precinct. Yep. And that's kind of where a lot of stuff went down not long ago. How yes. was that for you guys? We, you have lived, we, we have lived in interesting times, 
put it that way for sure. <laughs> Boy, it's been amazing. Uh, the, the good and the bad of the, the, the relationships we've made with our surrounding, you know, close neighbors is incredible. Yeah, and I love them. I mean, they are great. You know, and none of us are the same color. Okay. It's yeah. if we are we are very much the minority in this neighborhood. And uh, I, my dad was a deputy sheriff, and he taught me how to shoot. And he said you should never own a gun unless you know you could aim that at someone and pull the trigger. I'd never owned a gun. My first two husbands and my last husband all owned guns. Actually, I've slept many years having a loaded pistol underneath the pillow of the man next to me. So I've, I've had close relationship with guns in that respect. But I, you know, that part of my life was over. I bought a shotgun. When all this started, I went and bought a shotgun. I knew for Hardy and for our neighbors, I could blow someone away. And coming to that knowledge was, was, was it was frightening. Excuse me. Um, but, and then when all of this blew up and continued to blow, uh, I was out on the street with a loaded shotgun with members of AIM yeah. because these Boogaloo boys were trying to, to destroy our neighborhood store. Yeah. And so Hardy was running with one group of AIM members pulling, yeah. pulling barricades. Yeah. And so yeah. we're standing out there yeah. and all of a sudden we hear down the line, shooters coming and thank God, I ran back in the house to get all of my shells because the time it took me to get my shells and to get up to the corner, the shooter was coming from the south. They did not know that the cops were coming from the west and they hit the group of AIM who were up on our corner guarding our store. They hit them with with tear yeah. gas. Yeah. So here would have been this almost 70 year old woman with allergies to everything in the middle of tear gas. I don't know if I would, <laughs> yeah. would have fared too well, but after the police realized what they were doing, then, then they were cool with it. They left them stay. And then the national guard came and sat on our corner. And the beauty of that I know a lot of people don't like the guard and don't like the police and stuff. When the guard moved in, you could feel this neighborhood take a breath. Everybody, we hadn't been sleeping. No. It was none weren't of their cars. Weren't there cars with no license plates and Carolina no. license plates and no, no all place. sorts of people yeah. from out of state. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Boogaloo boys were an item and I, I told Hardy, I said, if I never see another Texas or North Carolina plate on our street again, that'll be just fine with me. Yeah. Or the, the, the no plates. The no plates, yeah. Was, was yeah. really scary. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't know how they got a way of driving around with no plates. Oh, no, it was more televised. Oh, I mean, it was more televised. Yeah. All the cops had quit by that point, too, yeah. you know, because. Oh, and that was. Yeah. The, the freakiest thing, after they set the precinct on fire, which the precinct is like a mile away from us. Not even that, yeah. Here came, and this is in my mind, just etched. Oh, across yeah. the street from us, uh, a number of Eastern, East African families yeah. live yeah. with little kids. Here comes a parade squad yeah, cars. 25 cars. Yeah. With their oh. light on and the sirens going and the little girl across they don't they have to knock to let have somebody let them in the house they've been outside playing and this little girl maybe what six yeah, is banging. outside banging on the door yeah. screaming for them to let her in 
Oh, oh God. Oh. They were they were here to terrorize the neighborhood. So then yeah. they left and we were left to deal with these Bulu people. Yeah. And uh it was absolutely frightening. But the guards, yeah. they park yeah. over there. Hardy and I took breakfast to them the first morning because they did you. Yeah. They moved, tell you about that. They moved in right after the AIM people were were tear gassed. Shortly after that, the guard came in that night and parked in front of our store. And wow. so that morning, we walk like five o'clock in the morning. We walk over with our orange juice and bananas for them. And right next to the right next to the truck is this homeless person wrapped in an army blanket and I told Hardy I said our own city can't take care of these people and here these boys come down from northern Minnesota and yeah. and they take care of him and it was beautiful because other people started bringing in yeah. breakfast mm -hmm. and lunch and dinner for these kids. Aww. Oh, I think they're called K-rations to eat. Like Hardy, it was funny. Um, yeah, I, I brought them well, some, some crackers, some kipper snacks in a paper bag. And one guy said, I appreciate it, but we can't accept, you know, food from people and stuff like that. And I said, oh, okay. And I, I dropped my bag on a retaining wall and said, oh, I dropped my bag and walked off. Yeah. Behind, me, <laughs> behind me, I heard, Kipper snacks? Fuck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Hardy, you have got a uh, reading prepared for us, don't you? Yeah, I do. We um, would love to hear a bunch of your poems. Well, okay. Uh, fasten your seat belts, I guess. Uh, this one is titled Ramadan Spring 2019. This was actually before the pandemic. Um, with a quote, permitted to you on the night of the fast is the approach to your wife. She's your garment and thou art her garment. That's from the... Uh, Quran? Yeah, from the Quran. They are calloused, cut and blistered, for the days are long and her work is hard. She sweats, she bleeds, sometimes she cries, for I don't make life easy. And she wears my kisses when I'm going to work. And I cover myself in the shade of her eyes, the smell of her hair, well, the smell of her hair, and a compass call of home. And when I get there, bless this meal which she has cooked for me with blade and fire and water. And bless me with her imperfect, imperfectly human love served with hands as sure as rain, as sure as heaven falling on us. There is no one, not the angels, not even the prophet, who has held hands like these. In prayer, my God. Amen. Wow. And guess who that is for? <laughs> and this is actually a roommate of mine. Uh, when Petey was, before she moved in, I think, I wrote this, and I couldn't think of a title. And a roommate said, still there when the lights are on. So that's the title. <laughs> um, there is a darkness which resides in dreams. It never sleeps, just lurks in the closet, under the bed, like an undercover agent, someone you thought you knew. That kid on the playground who says, there's something that you gotta see. And when you follow him down the alley behind the schoolyard through the mist that crept in like Bela Lugosi, and he dared you to open that door, the one you'd never noticed before. And this, this is where the memories are stored. Why is it that only when we hide ourselves in sleep do the children who we might have been come out to play? Could it be they are our misplaced twins who were tucked away when what they had to say made grown-ups fidget, groan, mother wild eyes. Those drooling ninnies who, if could they speak, knew too much. If I had a flashlight which knew its way around the language of ghosts and other famished haints, 
I crawl beneath the covers with you and flick it on so that we could read of heroes and bad guys and you and I who are no longer caught between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know who that's for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this one's titled Innocence and Debt. Uh, my wife, when she was younger, about the year the Stones played Ed Sullivan, had her first paid employment walking beans. That is not what you think if you're not from the fields, it's neck of the woods, and don't even ponder putting beans on a leash, and they won't fetch diddly. But anyway, she sent many a milkweed plant to meet its maker. So just the other night, we read out loud, as the mid-April snow plonked another foot onto our garden from the last testament of Tony Hoagland concerning a pachyderm who's shuffled off to the next round, being white keys on a Steinway. As the monarch butterflies hatch and head north, having no access to the weather channel, no early warning system, or as my old friend Tom said, while taking flight off a 28-foot ladder, shit, man, you never know. Like, man, when did all those generations of great speckled butterflies come up short along the food chain? Was that time her measly paycheck 56 years ago nudged her closer to meeting me? Suffice it to say, our love is in debt to all those who came and went before us, as if they had a choice in all their radiance becoming born. Mm -hmm. And do I have time for one more? Yes. Okay. And this is this is a taxi cab poem, actually. It's just oh, cool. The, the Pathways of My Town. It's fitting because that's where we met. Different <laughs> car, but you know, it's a taxi cab. <laughs> they both crown <found> Vicks. <laughs> at Arlington, the avenue, not the cemetery, sitting at a red light. The inebriate in the back seat told me for the 10th or 14th time that he's going to leave me 4 million and 50 cents worth of greenbacks in his last will and testament because I'm one hell of a driver and the best friend he ever had. And I offered up a silent prayer. If it be thine will, O oh Lord, make this asshole pay his fare, get out of my cab, not barf until he does so, and forget he ever saw me. And end the postscript. And get me back to my baby in one piece tonight. Trudging up the hill in second gear through the ice on Battle Creek, the road, not the war zone. The scars, too many to count, as she and I have bestowed upon each other in the name of our union. I realize, should I go blind, crippled in faith, I'll know her as Thomas knew Jesus by the flaws rendered in the palms of her hands. Crossing Gettysburg, Gettysburg the lane, not the address. Thought about what she said this morning. Well, even if we got no idea where we're going to land, the rent comes due, be it dead or alive. And she said, baby, if all we can afford is an urn, let's co inhabit that. I was reminiscing that motel just off Flying Cloud, the drive, not the promised land, where we watched our team win the series, wrecked that kitchen paneling and never got caught, read out loud around the missing pages of her honeymoon in exile. We were, I think, the Dalai Lama then, in some kind of reincarnation, our blessing cast upon the long road home. Oh, okay, I want one more. You and want I'm gonna pick it. It's um, <laughs> from the road by heart. I loved, it's on page 25. She knows the sound of one hand applauding God's creation. That is for my youngest, Rose. <laughs> she doesn't want me to read it, but she's probably not here. <laughs> uh, there are places, I hear, where she'd be considered almost normal. Brown hair with a touch of wave, her first training bra, a hand on the right side, none on the left. There's a town in Iraq where all the kids are missing something. An eye, a leg, the ability to speak. 
It's a miracle of birth. Roll the dice and see what you get. It is a wonder of commerce. Buy now, pay later. And the ease of technology. Turn on the lights and hear the rivers scream. The graceful children prance and tumble, learning how to compens compensate. Hops got you with what they got. Five, six, seven, eight, a clip wing angel's curly gait. Now all the fifth graders have wooden flutes, which they unwrap and blow on festival days for the parents, the teachers, for each other. It's a joyous occasion, and I mean that. My daughter cannot play the flute, but she sings in the choir like a bird of prey. There are no repercussions for who she takes with her one quick talent. Her voice is the aftershock of lightning, wind chiming the clouds. In its presence, I can fly, and I don't need permission. My little girl just sends me. At the birth, in her home, in her bedroom, with my wife, with friends and siblings, I heard her, I held her streaming, steaming, creamy six pound body close, complete, five fingers and 10 toes. I adored her then as I do now, but I hated God that day. And still, I trade my arm for hers. When, three, when she was three days old, we took her in and Dr. Mayer told me, it's not the maker's fault, so let him off the hook. There could be 500 reasons why, and you'll never find the one. But if I do, and it was you, I love my child. I will make you pay. That's just, oh. it's a, oof. Yeah. Well, we got, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And we got to check in with Julie. Did you get my numbers I sent you? Did they go? I did. I did not get the numbers you sent. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> naughty, naughty. Okay. So uh, should I just tell you? I guess on my you... iPad and it doesn't work very well for me to do chat. As, as whisper as them. As River, whisper them. Niwen. <laughs> no, that's that's a good way. Um, um, the four. Okay. And thirty-five. I think it was. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> when we're looking for the closest to those numbers, it says without... someone had three. Colleen has three. So oh. Colleen is the winner. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and then the next closest um, would be Barry oh. at 32. Oh, so each of the one, um, send a message to those two with your address, and then they'll, s they'll send you the books. I took you home once, Colleen, but I can't remember that, that closely. <laughs> you did. After the gathering at the um, Dave Shove's uh, yeah. reading, and we were at Merlin's Rest, and then, um, yeah, you offered to drive me back. That was so kind of you. <laughs> All the way to St. Paul. <laughs> yeah, long, long walk, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was late and cold, as I recall. <laughs> David was still alive then, wasn't he? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. I haven't been to the series since, um, well, I've attended on Zoom once or twice, but I haven't been to the, you know, they've held it in that location. I haven't been since he passed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I miss him. <laughs> yes. He was a one of a kind. <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, get, get, get your address to us. And... Okay. So. Oh, cool. Cool. <laughs>